The Last of the Masters, also known as Protection Agency, written by Philip K. Dick and performed by Frank Markopoulos of frankmarkopoulos.com. Bookquarium Audio. Consciousness collected around him. He returned with reluctance. The weight of centuries, an unbearable fatigue, lay over him. The ascent was painful. He would have shrieked if there were anything to shriek with. And anyhow, he was beginning to feel glad. Eight thousand times he had crept back thus, with ever-increasing difficulty. Some day, he wouldn't make it. Some day, the black pool would remain. But not this day. He was still alive. Above the aching pain and reluctance came joyful triumph. Good morning, a bright voice said. Isn't it a nice day? I'll pull the curtains and you can look out. He could see and hear, but he couldn't move. He lay quietly and allowed the various sensations of the room to pour in on him. Carpets, wallpaper, tables, lamps, pictures, desk and vid screen, gleaming yellow sunlight streamed through the window, blue sky, distant hills, fields, buildings, roads, factories, workers and machines. Peter Green was busily straightening things, his young face wreathed with smiles. Lots to do today, lots of people to see you, bills to sign, decisions to make. Uh, This is Saturday. There will be people coming in from the remote sectors. I hope the maintenance crew has done a good job, he added quickly. Oh, they they have, of course. (laughs) I talked to Fowler on my way over here. Uh, Everything's fixed up fine. The youth's pleasant tenor mixed with the bright sunlight, sounds and sights, but nothing else. He could feel nothing. He tried to move his arm, but nothing happened. Don't worry, Green said, catching his terror. They'll soon be along with the rest. (laughs) You'll be all right. Uh, You have to be. How could we survive without you? (laughs) He relaxed. God knew it had happened often enough before. Anger surged dully. Why couldn't they coordinate? Get it up all at once, not piecemeal. (sighs) He'd have to change their schedule. Make them organize better. Past the bright window, a squat metal car chugged to a halt. Uniformed men piled out, gathered up heavy armloads of equipment, and hurried toward the main entrance of the building. Here they come! Green exclaimed with relief. A little late, eh? (laughs) Another traffic tie-up, Fowler snorted as he entered. Something wrong with the signal system again. Outside flow got mixed up with the urban stuff. Tied up on all sides. I wish you'd change the law. Now there was motion all around him. The shapes of Fowler and McLean loomed, two giant moons abruptly ascendant professional faces that peered down at him anxiously. He was turned over on his side, muffled conferences, urgent whispers, the clank of tools. Here, Fowler muttered. Now here. No, that's later. Be careful. Now run it up through here. The work continued in taut silence. He was aware of their closeness. Dim outlines occasionally cut off his light. He was turned this way and that, thrown around like a sack of meal. Okay, Fowler said. Tape it. A long silence. He gazed dully at the wall, at the slightly faded blue and pink wallpaper, an old design that showed a woman in hoop skirts with a little parasol over her dainty shoulder, a frilly white blouse, tiny tips of shoes, an astoundingly clean puppy at her side. Then he was turned back to face upward. Five shapes groaned and strained over him. Their fingers flew, their muscles rippled under their shirts. At last they straightened up and retreated. Fowler wiped sweat from his face. They were all tense and bleary-eyed. Go ahead, Fowler rasped. Throw it. Shock hit him. He gasped. His body arched then settled down slowly. 
his body. He could feel. He moved his arms experimentally. He touched his face, his shoulder, the wall. The wall was real and hard. All at once, the world had become three-dimensional again. Relief showed on Fowler's face. Thank God, he sagged wearily. Well, how do you feel? After a moment, he answered, mm, All right. Fowler sent the rest of the crew out. Green began dusting again. Off in the corner, Fowler sat on the edge of the bed and lit his pipe. Now, listen to me, he said. I've got bad news. I'll give it to you the way you always want it, straight from the shoulder. What is it? he demanded. He examined his fingers. He already knew. There were dark circles under Fowler's eyes. He hadn't shaved. His square-jawed face was drawn and unhealthy. We were up all night, working on your motor system. We've got it jury-rigged, but it won't hold. Not more than a, another few months. The thing's climbing. The basic units can't be replaced. When they wear out, uh, they're gone. We can weld in relays and wiring, but we can't fix the five synapsis coils. There were uh, only a few men who could make those, and they've been dead two centuries. If the coils burn out... Is there any deterioration in the synapsis coils? He interrupted. Not yet. Just motor areas, arms in particular. What's happening to your legs will happen to your arms and finally all your motor system. You'll be paralyzed by the end of the year. You'll be able to see, hear, and think, and broadcast. But, uh, <laughs> that's all, he added. Uh, sorry, Bors. Uh, we're doing all we can. All right, Bors said. You're excused. Thanks for telling me straight, I guessed. Ready to go down? A lot of people with problems today. They're stuck until you get there. <laughs> Let's go. He focused his mind with an effort and turned his attention to the details of the day. I want the heavy metals research program speeded. It's lagging, as usual. I may have to pull a number of men from related work and shift them to the generators. The water level will be dropping soon. I want to start feeding power along the lines while there's still power to feed. As soon as I turn my back, everything starts falling apart. Fowler signaled Green, and he came quickly over. The two of them bent over Bors, and, grunting, hoisted him up and carried him to the door, down the corridor, and outside. They deposited him in the squat metal car, the new little service truck. Its polished surface was a startling contrast to his pitted, corroded hull, bent and splotched and eaten away, a dull, patina-covered machine of archaic steel and plastic that hummed faintly, rustily, as the men leaped in the front seat and raced the car out onto the main highway. Edward Tolby perspired, pushed his pack up higher, hunched over, tightened his gun belt, and cursed. Daddy, Sylvia reproved. Cut that. Tolby spat furiously in the grass at the side of the road. He put his arm around his slim daughter. Sorry, Sylv. Nothing personal. The damn heat. Mid-morning sun shimmered down on the dusty road. Clouds of dust rose and billowed around the three as they pushed slowly along. They were dead tired. Tolby's heavy face was flushed and sullen. An unlit cigarette dangled between his lips. His big, powerfully built body was hunched resentfully forward. His daughter's canvas shirt clung moistly to her arms and breasts. Moons of sweat darkened her back. Under her jeans, her thigh muscles rippled wearily. Robert Penn walked a little behind the two Tolbys, hands deep in his pockets, eyes on the road ahead. His mind was blank. He was half asleep from the double shot of hexobarb he had swallowed at the last league camp. And the heat lulled him. On each side of the road, 
fields stretched out, pastures of grass and weeds, a few trees here and there, a tumbled-down farmhouse, the ancient rusting remains of a bomb shelter, two centuries old, once some dirty sheep. Sheep, Penn said, they eat the grass too far down, it won't grow back. Now he's a farmer, Tolby said to his daughter. Daddy, Sylvia snapped, stop being nasty. Ah, it's this heat, this damn heat. Tolby cursed again, loudly and futilely. It's not worth it. <sighs> For ten pinks, I'd go back and tell them it was a lot of pig swill. Maybe it is at that, Penn said mildly. All right, you go back, Tolby grunted. You go back and tell them it's a lot of pig swill. Yeah, they'll pin a medal on you, maybe raise you up a grade. Penn laughed. <laughs> Both of you shut up. Uh, there's some kind of town ahead. Tolby's massive body straightened eagerly. Where? He shielded his eyes. Oh, by God, he's right, a village. And it isn't a mirage. You see it, don't you? His good humor returned, and he rubbed his big hands together. What say, Pen? A couple of beers? Uh, a few games of throw? With some of the local peasants? Maybe we can stay overnight? He licked his thick lips with anticipation. Some of those <laughs> village wenches, uh, the kind that hang around the grog shops. I know the kind you mean, Pen broke in. The kind that are tired of doing nothing. Want to see the big commercial centers. Want to meet some guy that'll buy them mecco stuff and take them places. <laughs> At the side of the road, a farmer was watching them curiously. He had halted his horse and stood leaning on his crude plow, hat pushed back on his head. What's the name of this town? Tolby yelled. The farmer was silent a moment. He was an old man, thin and weathered. This town? he repeated. Yeah, the one ahead. That's a nice town, the farmer eyed the three of them. You been through here before? No, sir, Tolby said. Never. Team breakdown? No, we're on foot. How far you come? About a hundred and fifty miles. The farmer considered the heavy packs strapped on their backs, their cleated hiking shoes. Dusty clothing and weary, sweat-streaked faces, jeans and canvas shirts, ironite walking staffs. That's a long way, he said. How far are you going? As far as we like it, Tolby answered. Is there a place ahead we can stay, hotel, in? That town, the farmer said, is Fairfax. It has a lumber mill. One of the best in the world, a couple of pottery works, a place where you can get clothes put together by machines, regular mecco clothing, uh, a gun shop where they pour the best shot this side of the Rockies, and a bakery. Oh, also, there's an old doctor living there and a lawyer, and some people with books to teach the kids. They came with TB. They made a schoolhouse out of an old barn. How large a town? Penn asked. A lot of people. More born all the time. Old folks die, kids die. Ah. We had a fever last year. About a hundred kids died. Doctor said it came from the water hole. We shut the water hole down. Kids died anyhow. Doctor said it was the milk. Drove off half the cows. Not mine. I stood out there with my gun and I shot the first of them. Came to drive off my cows. Kids stopped dying as soon as fall came. I think it was the heat. Sure is hot, Tolby agreed. Yes, it gets hot around here. Water's pretty scarce. A crafty look slid across his old face. You folks want a drink? The young lady looks pretty tired. Got some bottles of water down under the house. In the mud. Nice and cold, he hesitated. Pink a glass, Tolby laughed. Uh, no thanks. Mm, two glasses of pink, the farmer said. Not interested, Penn said. He thumped his canteen, and the three of them started on. So long. The farmer's face hardened. Damn foreigners, he muttered. He turned angrily back to his plowing. The town baked in silence. 
Flies buzzed and settled on the backs of stupefied horses tied up at posts. A few cars were parked here and there. People moved listlessly along the sidewalks. Elderly, lean-bodied men dozed on porches. Dogs and chickens slept in the shade under houses. The houses were small, wooden, chipped and peeling boards, leaning and angular, and old, warped and split by age and heat. Dust lay over everything, a thick blanket of dry dust over the cracking houses and the dull-faced men and animals. Two lank men approached them from an open doorway. Who are you? What do you want? They stopped and got out their identification. The men examined the sealed plastic cards, photographs, fingerprints, data. Finally, they handed them back. A.L., one said. You really from the Anarchist League? That's right, Tolby said. Even the girl? The men eyed Sylvia with languid greed. Tell you what, let us have the girl a while and we'll skip the head tax. <laughs> Don't kid me. Tolby grunted. Since when does the League pay head tax or any other tax? He pushed past them impatiently. Where's the grog shop? I'm dying. A two-story white building was on their left. Men lounged on the porch, watching them vacantly. Penn headed toward it, and the Tolbys followed. A faded, peeling sign lettered across the front read, Beer, Wine on Tap. This is it. Penn said. He guided Sylvia up the sagging steps, past the men, and inside. Tolby followed. He unstrapped his pack gratefully as he came. The place was cool and dark. A few men and women were at the bar. The rest sat around tables. Some youths were playing throw in the back. A mechanical tune maker wheezed and composed in the corner, a shabby, half-ruined machine, only partially functioning. Behind the bar, a primitive scene shifter created and destroyed vague phantasmagoria. Seascapes, mountain peaks, snowy valleys, great rolling hills, a nude woman that lingered and then dissolved into one vast breast, dim, uncertain processions that no one noticed or looked at. The bar itself was an incredibly ancient sheet of transparent plastic, stained and chipped and yellow with age. Its engrav coat, had faded from one end. Bricks now propped it up. The drink mixer had long since fallen apart. Only wine and beer were served. No living man knew how to mix the simplest drink. Tolby moved up to the bar. Beer, he said. Three beers. Penn and Sylvia sank down at a table and removed their packs. As the bartender served Tolby three mugs of thick, dark beer, he showed his card and carried the mugs over to the table. The youths in the back had stopped playing. They were watching the three as they sipped their beer and unlaced their hiking boots. After a while, one of them came slowly over. Say, he said, you're from the League. That's right, Tolby murmured sleepily. Everyone in the place was watching and listening. The youth sat down across from the three. His companions flocked excitedly around and took seats on all sides. The juveniles of the town, bored, restless, dissatisfied. Their eyes took in the ironite staffs, the guns, the heavy metal cleated boots. A murmured whisper rustled through them. They were about eighteen, tanned, rangy. How did you get in? one demanded bluntly. The League? Tolby leaned back in his chair, found a match, and lit his cigarette. He unfastened his belt, belched loudly, and settled back contentedly. You get in by examination. What do you have to know? Tolby shrugged. About everything. He belched again and scratched thoughtfully at his chest between two buttons. He was conscious of the ring of people around on all sides, a little old man with a beard and horn-rimmed glasses, at another table a great tub of a man in a red shirt and blue striped trousers, with a bulging stomach. Youths, farmers, a negro in a dirty white shirt and trousers, a book under his arm, a hard-jawed blonde, 
hair in a net, red nails and high heels, tight yellow dress, sitting with a gray-haired businessman in a dark brown suit, a tall young man holding hands with a young black-haired girl, huge eyes in a soft white blouse and skirt, little slippers kicked under the table. Under the table her bare, tanned feet twisted. Her slim body was bent forward with interest. Well, you have to know, Tolby said, how the League was formed. You have to know how we pulled down the governments that day, pulled them down and destroyed them, burned all the buildings, all the records, billions of microfilms and papers, great bonfires that burned for weeks, and the swarms of little white things that poured out when we knocked the buildings over. <laughs> you killed them? the great tub of a man asked, lips twitching avidly. We let them go. They were harmless. They ran and hid. <laughs> Under rocks. Tolby laughed. Funny little scurrying things. Insects. Then we went in and gathered up all the records and equipment for making records. By God, we burned everything. And the robots, a youth said. Yeah, we smashed all the government robots. There weren't many of them. They were used only at high levels, when a lot of facts had to be integrated. The youth's eyes bulged. You saw them? You, you were there when they smashed the robots? Penn laughed. Tolby means the League. That was two hundred years ago. The youth grinned nervously. Yeah, tell us about the marches. Tolby drained his mug and pushed it away. I'm out of beer. The mug was quickly refilled. He grunted his thanks and continued, voice deep and furry, dulled with fatigue. The marches. <laughs> That was really something, they say. All over the world, people getting up, throwing down what they were doing. It started in East Germany, the hard-jawed blonde said. The riots. Then it spread to Poland, the Negro put in shyly. My grandfather used to tell me how everybody sat and listened to the television. His grandfather used to tell him. It spread to Czechoslovakia and then Austria and Romania and Bulgaria, then France and Italy. France was first, the little old man with beard and glasses cried violently. They were without a government a whole month. Uh, the people saw they could live without a government. The marches started it, the black-haired girl corrected. That was the first time they started pulling down the government buildings. In East Germany and Poland, big mobs of unorganized workers. Russia and America were last, Tolby said. When the march on Washington came, there was... Close to twenty million of us. We were big in those days. <laughs> they couldn't stop us when we finally moved. They shot a lot, the hard-faced blonde said. Oh, sure, but the people kept coming and yelling to the soldiers. Hey, Bill, don't shoot. Hey, Jack, it's me, Joe. Don't shoot. We're friends. Don't kill us. Join us. And by God, after a while, they did. They couldn't keep from shooting their own people. They finally threw down their guns and got out of the way. And then you found the place, the little black-haired girl said breathlessly. Yeah, we found the place. Six places. Three in America, one in Britain, two in Russia. It took us ten years to find the last place and make sure it was the last place. What then? the youth asked, bug-eyed. Then we busted every one of them. Tolby raised himself up, a massive man, beer mug clutched, heavy face flushed, dark red. Every damn A-bomb in the whole world. There was an uneasy silence. Yeah, the youth murmured, you sure took care of those war people. Won't be any more of them, the great tub of a man said. They're gone for good. Tolby fingered his ironite staff. Maybe so, and maybe not. There might just be a few of them left. Oh, what do you mean? The tub of a man demanded. Tolby raised his hard, gray eyes. It's time you people stopped kidding us. You know damn well what I mean. We've heard rumors. Some place around this area, there's a bunch of them hiding out. Shocked disbelief, then anger hummed 
to a roar. That's a lie, the tub of a man shouted. Is it? The little man with beard and glasses leaped up. There's nobody here that has anything to do with governments. We're all good people. You better watch your step. One of the youths said softly to Tolby, People around here don't like to be accused. Tolby got unsteadily to his feet, his ironite staff gripped. Penn got up beside him, and they stood together. If any of you knows something, Tolby said, you better tell it right now. Nobody knows anything, the hard-faced blonde said. You're talking to honest folks. That's so the negro said, nodding his head. Nobody here's doing anything wrong. You saved our lives, the black-haired girl said. If you hadn't pulled down the governments, we'd all be dead in the war. Why should we hold back something? That's true, the great tub of a man grumbled. We wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for the League. You think we'd do anything against the League? Come on, Sylvia said to her father. Let's go. She got to her feet, and tossed Penn his pack. Tolby grunted belligerently. Finally, he took his own pack and hoisted it to his shoulder. The room was deathly silent. Everyone stood frozen as the three gathered their things and moved toward the door. The little dark-haired girl stopped them. The next town is thirty miles from here she said. The road's blocked, her tall companion explained. Slides closed it years ago. Why don't you stay with us tonight? There's plenty of room at our place. You can rest up and get an early start tomorrow. We don't want to impose, Sylvia murmured. Tolby and Penn glanced at each other, then at the girl. If you're sure you have plenty of room... The great tub of a man approached them. Listen, I have ten yellow slips. I want to give them to the League. I sold my farm last year. I don't need any more slips. I'm living with my brother and his family. He pushed the slips at Tolby. Here. Tolby pushed them back. Keep them. This way, the tall young man said as they clattered down the sagging steps into a sudden blinding curtain of heat and dust. We have a car. Over this way, an old gasoline car. My dad fixed it so it burns oil. You should have taken the slips, Penn said to Tolby as they got into the ancient, battered car. Flies buzzed around them. They could hardly breathe. The car was a furnace. Sylvia fanned herself with a rolled-up paper. The black-haired girl unbuttoned her blouse. What do we need money for? Tolby laughed good-naturedly. I haven't paid for anything in my life. Neither have you. The car sputtered and moved slowly forward onto the road. It began to gain speed. Its motor banged and roared. Soon it was moving surprisingly fast. You saw them, Sylvia said over the racket. They'd give us anything they had. We saved their lives. She waved at the fields, the farmers and their crude teams, the withered crops, the sagging old farmhouses. They'd all be dead if it hadn't been for the League. She smashed a fly, peevishly. They depend on us. The black-haired girl turned toward them as the car rushed along the decaying road. Sweat streaked her tanned skin. Her half-covered breasts trembled with the motion of the car. I'm Laura Davis. Pete and I have an old farmhouse his dad gave us when we got married. Yeah, you can have the hole downstairs, Pete said. There's no electricity, but we've got a big fireplace. <laughs> it gets cold at night. It's hot in the day, but when the sun sets, it gets uh, terribly cold. We'll be all right, Penn murmured. The vibration of the car made him a little sick. Yes, the girl said, her black eyes flashing, her crimson lips twisted. She leaned toward Penn intently, her small face strangely alight. Yes, we'll... Take good care of you. At that moment, the car left the road. Sylvia shrieked. Tolby threw himself down, head between his knees doubled up in a ball. A sudden curtain of green burst around Penn, then a sickening emptiness as the car plunged down. It struck with a roaring crash that blotted out everything.
a single titanic cataclysm of fury that picked Pen up and flung his remains in every direction. Put me down, Bors ordered, on this railing for a moment before I go inside. The crew lowered him onto the concrete surface and fastened magnetic grapples into place. Men and women hurried up the wide steps in and out of the massive building that was Bors' main offices. The sight from these steps pleased him. He liked to stop here and look around at his world, at the civilization he had carefully constructed, each piece added painstakingly, scrupulously, with infinite care throughout the years. It wasn't big. The mountains ringed it on all sides. The valley was a level bowl surrounded by dark, violet hills. Outside, beyond the hills, the regular world began. Parched fields, blasted poverty-stricken towns, decayed roads, the remains of houses, tumbled down farm buildings, ruined cars and machinery, dust-covered people, creeping listlessly around in handmade clothing, dull rags and tatters. He had seen the outside. He knew what it was like. At the mountains, the blank faces, the disease, the withered crops, the crude plows and ancient tools, all ended here, here within the ring of hills. Boers had constructed an accurate and detailed reproduction of a society two centuries gone, the world as it had been in the old days, the time of governments, the time that had been pulled down by the Anarchist League. Within his five synapsis coils, the plans, knowledge, information, blueprints of a whole world existed. In the two centuries, he had carefully recreated that world, had made this miniature society that glittered and hummed on all sides of him. The roads, buildings, houses, industries of a dead world, all a fragment of the past, built with his hands, his own metal fingers, and brain. Fowler, Bors said. Fowler came over. He looked haggard. His eyes were red-rimmed and swollen. What is it? You want to go inside? Overhead, the morning patrol thundered past, a string of black dots against the sunny, cloudless sky. Bors watched with satisfaction. Quite a sight. Right on the nose, Fowler agreed, examining his wristwatch. To their right, a column of heavy tanks snaked along a highway between green fields. Their gun snouts glittered. Behind them, a column of foot soldiers marched, faces hidden behind bacteria masks. I'm thinking, Bors said, that it may be unwise to trust Green any longer. Why the hell do you say that? Every ten days I'm inactivated, so your crew can see what repairs are needed. Bors twisted restlessly. For twelve hours I'm completely helpless. Green takes care of me, sees nothing happens, but... But what? It occurs to me perhaps there'd be more safety in a squad of troops. It's too much of a temptation for one man, alone. Fowler scowled. I don't see that. How about me? I have charge of inspecting you. I could switch a few leads around, send a load through your synapsis coils, blow them out. <laughs> Boars whirled wildly, then subsided. True, you could do that. After a moment, he demanded, But what would you gain? You know, I'm the only one who can keep all this together. I'm the only one who knows how to maintain a planned society, not a disorderly chaos. If it weren't for me, all this would collapse, and you'd have dust and ruins and weeds. The whole outside would come rushing in to take over. Of course, so why worry about green? Trucks of workers rumbled past, loads of men in blue-green, sleeves rolled up, 
armloads of tools, a mining team heading for the mountains. Take me inside, Bohr said abruptly. Fowler called McLean. They hoisted Bohr's and carried him past the throngs of people, into the building, down the corridor and to his office. Officials and technicians moved respectfully out of the way as the great, pitted, corroded tank was carried past. All right, Bohr said impatiently. That's all. You can go. Fowler and McLean left the luxurious office with its lush carpets, furniture, drapes, and rows of books. Bohr's was already bent over his desk, sorting through heaps of reports and papers. Fowler shook his head as they walked down the hall. He won't last much longer. The motor system? Can't we reinforce the... I don't mean that. He's breaking up mentally. He can't take the strain any longer. Eh, none of us can, McLean muttered. Running this thing is too much for him. Knowing it's all dependent on him. Knowing as soon as he turns his back or lets down, it'll begin to come apart at the seams. A hell of a job trying to shut out the real world, keeping his model universe running. He's gone on a long time, McLean said. Fowler brooded. Sooner or later, we're going to have to face the situation. Gloomily, he ran his fingers along the blade of a large screwdriver. He's wearing out. Sooner or later, somebody's going to have to step in. As he continues to decay, he stuck the screwdriver back in his belt with his pliers and hammer and soldering iron. One crossed wire. What's that? Fowler laughed. Now he's got me doing it. One crossed wire and poof. poof. But what then? That's the big question. Maybe, McLean said softly, you and I can then get off this rat race, you and I and all the rest of us, and live like uh, human beings. Rat race, Fowler murmured. Rats in a maze, doing tricks, performing chores thought up by somebody else. Hmm. McLean caught Fowler's eye. By somebody of another species. Tolby struggled vaguely. Silence, a faint dripping close by. A beam pinned his body down. He was caught on all sides by the twisted wreck of the car. He was head down. The car was turned on its side, off the road, in a gully, wedged between two huge trees. Bent struts and smashed metal all around him, and bodies. He pushed up with all his strength. The beam gave, and he managed to get to a sitting position. A tree branch had burst in the windshield. The black-haired girl, still turned toward the back seat, was impaled on it. The branch had driven through her spine, out her chest, and into the seat, she clutched at it with both hands, head limp, mouth half open. The man beside her was also dead. His hands were gone. The windshield had burst around him. He lay in a heap among the remains of the dashboard and the bloody shine of his own internal organs. Pen was dead. Neck snapped like a rotten broom handle. Tolby pushed his corpse aside and examined his daughter. Sylvia didn't stir. He put his ear to her shirt and listened. She was alive. Her heart beat faintly. Her bosom rose and fell against his ear. He wound a handkerchief around her arm, where the flesh was ripped open and oozing blood. She was badly cut and scratched. One leg was doubled under her, obviously broken. Her clothes were ripped, her hair matted with blood. But she was alive. He pushed the twisted door open and stumbled out. A fiery tongue of afternoon sunlight struck him, and he winced. He began to ease her limp body out of the car, past the twisted door frame. A sound. Tolby glanced up, rigid. Something was coming. 
a whirring insect that rapidly descended. He let go of Sylvia, crouched, glanced around, then lumbered awkwardly down the gully. He slid and fell and rolled among the green vines and jagged gray boulders. His gun gripped, he lay gasping in the moist shadows, peering upward. The insect landed, a small airship, jet-driven. The sight stunned him. He had heard about jets, seen photographs of them, been briefed and lectured in the history indoctrination courses at the league camps. But to see a jet, men swarmed out, uniformed men who started from the road, down the side of the gully, bodies crouched warily as they approached the wrecked car. They lugged heavy rifles. They looked grim and experienced as they tore the car doors open and scrambled in. One's gone, a voice drifted to him. Must be around somewhere. Look, this one's alive. This woman started to crawl out. The rest, uh, all, all dead. Huh. Furious cursing. Damn, Laura, she should have leaped. The fanatic little fool? Maybe she didn't have time. God's sake, the thing's all the way through her. Ugh. Horror and shocked dismay. We won't hardly be able to get her loose. Leave her. The officer directing things waved the men back out of the car. Leave them all. How about this wounded one? The leader hesitated. Kill her, he said finally. He snatched a rifle and raised the butt. Uh, the rest of you fan out and try to get the other one. He's probably... Tolby fired, and the leader's body broke in half. The lower part sank down slowly. The upper dissolved in ashy fragments. Tolby turned and began to move in a slow circle, firing as he crawled. He got two more of them before the rest retreated in panic to their jet-powered insect and slammed the lock. He had the element of surprise. Now, that was gone. They had strength and numbers. He was doomed. Already the insect was rising. They'd be able to spot him easily from above, but he had saved Sylvia. That was something. He stumbled down a dried-up creek bed. He ran aimlessly. He had no place to go. He didn't know the countryside, and he was on foot. He slipped on a stone and fell headlong. Pain and billowing darkness beat at him as he got unsteadily to his knees. His gun was gone, lost in the shrubbery. He spat broken teeth and blood. He peered wildly up at the blazing afternoon sky. The insect was leaving. It hummed off toward the distant hills. It dwindled, became a black ball, a fly speck, then disappeared. Tolby waited a moment. Then he struggled up the side of the ravine to the wrecked car. They had gone to get help. They'd be back. Now was his only chance. If he could get Sylvia out and down the road, into hiding, maybe, maybe a farmhouse, back to town. He reached the car and stood, dazed and stupefied. Three bodies remained, the two in the front seat, Penn in the back. But Sylvia was gone. They had taken her with them, back where they came from. She had been dragged to the jet-driven insect. A trail of blood led from the car up the side of the gully to the highway. With a violent shudder, Tolby pulled himself together. He climbed into the car and pried loose Penn's gun from his belt. Sylvia's ironite staff rested on the seat. He took that, too. Then he started off down the road, walking without haste, carefully. Slowly, an ironic thought plucked at his mind. He had found what they were after, the men in uniform. They were organized, responsible to a central authority in a newly assembled jet. Beyond the hills was a government. Sir, Green said. He smoothed his short blonde hair anxiously, his young face twisting. Technicians and experts and ordinary people in droves were everywhere. The offices buzzed and echoed with the business of the day. Green pushed through the crowd and to the desk where Boris sat. 
propped up by two magnetic frames. Sir, Green said, something's happened. Bors looked up. He pushed a metal foil slate away and laid down his stylus. His eye cells clicked and flickered. Deep inside his battered trunk, motor gears whined. What is it? Green came close. There was something in his face, an expression Boris had never seen before. A look of fear and glassy determination. A glazed, fanatic cast, as if his flesh had hardened to rock. Sir, uh, scouts contacted a league team moving north. They met the team outside Fairfax. The the, the incident uh, took place directly beyond the first roadblock. Boers said nothing. On all sides, officials, experts, farmers, workmen, industrial managers, soldiers, people of all kinds buzzed and murmured and pushed forward impatiently, trying to get to Boers' desk, loaded down with problems to be solved, situations to be explained, the pressing business of the day. Roads, factories, disease control, repairs, construction, manufacture, design, planning. (sighs) Urgent problems for Boers to consider and deal with. Problems that couldn't wait. Was the League team destroyed? Boers said. One was killed. One was uh, wounded and brought here. Green hesitated. One uh, escaped for a long time. Boers was silent. Around him, the people murmured and shuffled. He ignored them. All at once he pulled the vid scanner to him and snapped the circuit open. One escaped. I don't like the sound of that. He he shot three members of our scout unit, including the leader. The others got frightened. They grabbed the injured girl and returned here. Boers' massive head lifted. They made a mistake. They should have located the one who escaped. This was the first time the situation—I know, Boers said, but it was an error. Better not to have touched them at all than to have taken two and allowed the third to get away. He turned to the vid scanner. Sound an emergency alert. Close down the factories. Arm the work crews and any male farmers capable of using weapons. Close every road. Remove the women and children to the undersurface shelters. Bring up the heavy guns and supplies. Suspend all non-military production and, he considered, (sighs) arrest everyone we're not sure of. On the sea sheet, have them shot. He snapped the scanner off. What'll happen? Green demanded, shaken. The thing we've prepared for. Total war. We have weapons! Green shouted excitedly. In an hour there'll be ten thousand men ready to fight. We have jet-driven ships, heavy artillery, bombs, bacteria pellets. What's, what's, what's the league? (laughs) A lot of people with packs on their backs. (laughs) Yes, Bohr said, a lot of people with packs on their backs. How can they do anything? How can a bunch of anarchists organize? They have no structure, no control, no central power. They have the whole world. A billion people. Individuals. A club. Not subject to law. Voluntary membership. (laughs) We have disciplined organization. Every aspect of our economic life operates at maximum efficiency. Uh, We, uh, uh, you, uh, have your thumb on, 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 on everything. All you have to do is give the order. Set the machine in motion. Boers nodded slowly. It's true the anarchist can't coordinate, the League can't organize. It's a paradox. Government by anarchists, anti-government actually, instead of governing the world, they tramp around to make sure no one else does. Dog in the manger. As you say, they're actually a voluntary club of totally unorganized individuals, without law or central authority. They maintain no society, they can't govern, all they can do is interfere with anyone else who tries. Troublemakers. But... But what? It was this way before, two centuries ago. They were unorganized, unarmed, vast mobs without discipline or authority, yet they pulled down all the governments all over the world. We've got a whole army. All the roads are mined. Heavy guns, bombs, pellets. Every one of us is a soldier. We're an armed camp. 
Bors was deep in thought. Y you say one of them is here, one of the League agents. A young woman. Bors signaled the nearby maintenance crew. Take me to her. I want to talk to her in the time remaining. Sylvia watched silently as the uniformed men pushed and grunted their way into the room. They staggered over to the bed, pulled two chairs together, and carefully laid down their massive arm load. Quickly, they snapped protective struts into place, locked the chairs together, threw magnetic grapples into operation, and then warily retreated. All right, the robot said. You can go. The men left. Bors turned to face the woman on the bed. A machine, Sylvia whispered, white-faced. You're a machine. Bors nodded slightly without speaking. Sylvia shifted uneasily on the bed. She was weak. One leg was in a transparent plastic cast. Her face was bandaged, and her right arm ached and throbbed. Outside the window, the late afternoon sun sprinkled through the drapes. Flowers bloomed, grass, hedges, and beyond the hedges, buildings and factories. For the last hour, the sky had been filled with jet-driven ships, great flocks that raced excitedly across the sky toward distant hills. Along the highway, cars hurtled, dragging guns and heavy military equipment. Men were marching in close rank, Rows of gray-clad soldiers, guns and helmets and bacteria masks, endless lines of figures identical in their uniforms, stamped from the same matrix. There are a lot of them, Bors said, indicating the marching men. Yes. Sylvia watched a couple of soldiers hurry by the window. Youths with worried expressions on their smooth faces, helmets bobbing at their waists, long rifles, canteens, counters, radiation shields, bacteria masks wound awkwardly around their necks, ready to go into place. They were scared, hardly more than kids. Others followed. A truck roared into life. The soldiers were swept off to join the others. They're going to fight, Bors said, to defend their homes and factories. All this equipment, you manufacture it, don't you? That's right. Our industrial organization is perfect. We're totally productive. Our society here is operated rationally, scientifically. We're fully prepared to meet this emergency. Suddenly, Sylvia realized what the emergency was. The League! One of us must have got away! She pulled herself up. Which of them? Penn or my father? I don't know, the robot murmured indifferently. Horror and disgust choked Sylvia. My God, she said softly, you have no understanding of us. You run all this, and you're incapable of empathy. You're nothing but a mechanical computer, one of the old government integration robots. That's right, two centuries old. She was appalled. And you've been alive all this time. We thought we destroyed all of you. I was missed. I had been damaged. I wasn't in my place. I was in a truck on my way out of Washington. I saw the mobs and escaped. Two hundred years ago, legendary times, you actually saw the events they tell us about. The old days, the great marches, the day the governments fell. Yes, I saw it all. A group of us formed in Virginia, experts, officials, skilled workmen. Later, we came here. It was remote enough, off the beaten path. <sighs> we heard rumors, a fragment still maintaining itself, but we didn't know where or how. I was fortunate, Bors said. I escaped by a fluke. All the others were destroyed. It's taken a long time to organize what you see here. Fifteen miles from here is a ring of hills. This valley is a bowl mountains on all sides. We've set up roadblocks in the form of natural slides. Nobody comes here, even in Fairfax, thirty miles off. They know nothing. That girl, Laura. Scouts. We keep scout teams in all inhabited regions within a hundred mile radius. As soon as you entered Fairfax, word was relayed to us. An air unit was dispatched. To avoid questions, we arranged to have you killed in an auto wreck. But one of you escaped. Sylvia shook her head, bewildered. 
How? she demanded. How do you keep going? Don't the people revolt? She struggled to a sitting position. They must know what's happened everywhere else. How do you control them? They're going out now in their uniforms. But will they fight? Can you count on them? Bors answered slowly. They trust me, he said. I brought with me a vast amount of knowledge, information and techniques lost to the rest of the world. Are jet ships and vid scanners and power cables made anywhere else in the world? I retain all that knowledge. I have memory units, synapsis coils. Because of me, they have these things. Things you only know as dim memories, vague legends. What happens when you die? I won't die. I'm eternal. You're wearing out. <laughs> you have to be carried around. And your right arm, you can hardly move it. Sylvia's voice was harsh, ruthless. Your whole tank is pitted and rusty. <laughs> the robot whirred. For a moment, he seemed unable to speak. My knowledge remains, he grated, finally. I'll always be able to communicate. Fowler has arranged a broadcast system. Even when I talk, he broke off. Even then, everything is under control. I've organized every aspect of the situation. I've maintained this system for two centuries. It's got to be kept going. Sylvia lashed out. It happened in a split second. The boot of her cast caught the chairs on which the robot rested. She thrust violently with her foot and hands. The chairs teetered, hesitated. Fowler! the robot screamed. Sylvia pushed with all her strength. Blinding agony seared through her leg. She bit her lip and threw her shoulder against the robot's pitted hulk. He waved his arms, whirred wildly, and then the two chairs slowly collapsed. The robot slid quietly from them, over on his back, his arms still waving helplessly. Sylvia dragged herself from the bed. She managed to pull herself to the window. Her broken leg hung uselessly, a dead weight in its transparent plastic cast. The robot lay like some futile bug. Arms waving, eye lens clicking, its rusty works whirring in fear and rage. Fowler! it screamed again. Help me! Sylvia reached the window. She tugged at the locks. They were sealed. She grabbed up a lamp from the table and threw it against the glass. The glass burst around her, a shower of lethal fragments. She stumbled forward, and then the repair crew was pouring into the room. Fowler gasped at the sight of the robot on its back. A strange expression crossed his face. Look at him! Help me, the robot shrilled. Help me! One of the men grabbed Sylvia around the waist and lugged her back to the bed. She kicked and bit, sunk her nails into the man's cheek. He threw her on the bed, face down, and drew his pistol. Stay there, he gasped. The others were bent over the robot, getting him to an upright position. What happened? Fowler said. He came over to the bed, his face twisting. Did he fall? Sylvia's eyes glowed with hatred and despair. I pushed him over. I almost got there. Her chest heaved. The window, but my leg... Get me back to my quarters, Bors cried. The crew gathered him up and carried him down the hall to his private office. A few moments later, he was sitting shakily at his desk, his mechanism pounding wildly, surrounded by his papers and memoranda. He forced down his panic and tried to resume his work. He had to keep going. His vid screen was alive with activity. The whole system was in motion. He blankly watched a subcommander sending up a cloud of black dots, jet bombers that shot up like flies and headed quickly off. The system had to be preserved. He repeated it again and again. He had to save it. Had to organize the people and make them save it. If the people didn't fight, wasn't everything doomed? Fury and desperation overwhelmed him. The system couldn't preserve itself. It wasn't a thing apart, something that could be separated from the people who lived it. Actually, it was the people. They were identical. When the people fought to preserve the system, they were fighting to preserve nothing less than themselves. 
they existed only as long as the system existed. He caught sight of a marching column of white-faced troops moving toward the hills. His ancient synapsis coils radiated and shuddered uncertainly, then fell back into pattern. He was two centuries old. He had come into existence a long time ago in a different world. That world had created him. Through him, that world still lived. As long as he existed, that world existed. In miniature, it still functioned. His model universe, his recreation, his rational, controlled world, in which each aspect was fully organized, fully analyzed and integrated. He kept a rational, progressive world alive, a humming oasis of productivity on a dusty, parched planet of decay and silence. <sighs> Bores spread out his papers and went to work on the most pressing problem, the transformation from a peacetime economy to full military mobilization, total military organization of every man, woman, child, piece of equipment, and dine of energy under his direction. Edward Tolby emerged cautiously. His clothes were torn and ragged. He had lost his pack, crawling through the brambles and vines. His face and hands were bleeding. He was utterly exhausted. Below him lay a valley, a vast bowl, fields, houses, highways, factories, equipment, men. He had been watching the men three hours endless streams of them pouring from the valley into the hills along the roads and paths, on foot, in trucks, in cars, armored tanks, weapons carriers, overhead in fast little jet fighters and great lumbering bombers, gleaming ships that took up positions above the troops and prepared for battle. Battle in the grand style. The two centuries old full-scale war that was supposed to have disappeared but here it was, a vision from the past. He had seen this in the old tapes and records used in the camp orientation courses. A ghost army resurrected to fight again. A vast host of men and guns prepared to fight and die. Tolby climbed down cautiously. At the foot of a slope of boulders, a soldier had halted his motorcycle and was setting up a communications antenna and transmitter. Tolby circled, crouched, expertly approached him. A blond-haired youth, fumbling nervously with the wires and relays, licking his lips uneasily, glancing up and grabbing for his rifle at every sound. Tolby took a deep breath. The youth had turned his back. He was tracing a power circuit. It was now or never. With one stride, Tolby stepped out, raised his pistol, and fired. The clump of equipment and the soldier's rifle vanished. Don't make a sound, Tolby said. He peered around. No one had seen. The main line was half a mile to his right. The sun was setting. Great shadows were falling over the hills. The fields were rapidly fading from brown-green to a deep violet. Put your hands up over your head, clasp them, and get down on your knees. The youth tumbled down in a frightened heap. Well, what are you going to do? He saw the ironite staff, and the color left his face. You're a league agent. Shut up, Tolby ordered. First, outline your system of responsibility. Who's your superior? The youth stuttered forth what he knew. Tolby listened intently. He was satisfied. The usual monolithic structure, exactly what he wanted. At the top, he broke in, at the top of the pillar, who has ultimate responsibility? Bors! Bors? Tolby scowled. That doesn't sound like a name. Sounds like... <sighs> he broke off, staggered. We should have guessed. An old government robot still functioning. <sighs> the youth saw his chance. He leaped up and darted frantically away. Tolby shot him above the left ear. The youth pitched over on his face and lay still. Tolby hurried to him, 
and quickly pulled off his dark gray uniform. It was too small for him, of course, but the motorcycle was just right. He'd seen tapes of them. He'd wanted one since he was a child, a fast little motorcycle to propel his weight around. Now he had it. Half an hour later, he was roaring down a smooth, broad highway toward the center of the valley and the buildings that rose against the dark sky. His headlights cut into the blackness. He still wobbled from side to side, but for all practical purposes, he had the hang of it. He increased speed. The road shot by, trees and fields, haystacks, stalled farm equipment. All traffic was going against him, troops hurrying to the front. The front. Lemmings going out into the ocean to drown. A thousand, ten thousand, metal-clad figures, armed and alert, weighted down with guns and bombs and flamethrowers and bacteria pellets. There was only one hitch. No army opposed them. A mistake had been made. It took two sides to make a war, and only one had been resurrected. A mile outside the concentration of buildings, he pulled his motorcycle off the road and carefully hid it in a haystack. For a moment, he considered leaving his ironite staff. Then he shrugged and grabbed it up, along with his pistol. He always carried his staff. It was the League symbol. It represented the walking anarchists who patrolled the world on foot, the world's protection agency. He loped through the darkness toward the outline ahead. There were fewer men here. He saw no women or children. A head-charged wire was set up. Troops crouched behind it, armed to the teeth. A searchlight moved back and forth across the road. Behind it, radar vanes loomed, and behind them, an ugly square of concrete, the great offices from which the government was run. For a time, he watched the searchlight. Finally, he had its motion plotted. In its glare, the faces of the troops stood out pale and drawn, youths. They had never fought. This was their first encounter. They were terrified. When the light was off him, he stood up and advanced toward the wire. Automatically, a breach was slid back for him. Two guards raised up and awkwardly crossed bayonets ahead of him. Show your papers, one demanded. Young lieutenants, boys, white-lipped, nervous, playing soldier. Pity and contempt made Tolby laugh harshly and push forward. Get out of my way. One anxiously flashed a pocket light. Halt! What's the code key for this watch? He blocked Tolby's way with his bayonet, hands twisting convulsively. Tolby reached in his pocket, pulled down his pistol, and as the searchlight started to swerve back, blasted the two guards. The bayonets clattered down, and he dived forward. Yells and shapes rose on all sides. Anguished, terrified shouts, random firing. The night was lit up as he dashed and crouched, turned a corner past a supply warehouse, raced up a flight of stairs and into the massive building ahead. He had to work fast. Gripping his ironite staff, he plunged down a gloomy corridor. His boots echoed, Men poured into the building behind him. Bolts of energy thundered past him. A whole section of the ceiling burst into ash and collapsed behind him. He reached stairs and climbed rapidly. He came to the next floor and groped for the door handle. Something flickered behind him. He half turned, his gun quickly up. A stunning blow sent him sprawling. He crashed against the wall. His gun flew from his fingers. A shape bent over him, rifle gripped. Who are you? What are you doing here? Not a soldier. A stubble-chinned man in a stained shirt and rumpled trousers, eyes puffy and red, a belt of tools, hammer, pliers, screwdriver, a soldering iron around his waist. Tolby raised himself up, painfully. If you didn't have that rifle... Fowler backed warily away. Who are you? This floor is forbidden to troops of the line. You know this... Then he saw the Ironite staff. By God, he said softly, you're the one they didn't get. He laughed shakily. <laughs> you're, you're, you're the one who, who got away. <laughs> Tolby's fingers tightened around the staff, but Fowler reacted instantly. The snout of the rifle jerked up on a line with Tolby's face. Be careful, Fowler warned. He turned slightly. Soldiers were hurrying up the stairs, boots drumming, echoing shouts ringing. 
For a moment he hesitated, then waved his rifle toward the stairs ahead. Up! Get going! Tolby blinked. What? Up! The rifle snout jabbed into Tolby. Hurry! Bewildered, Tolby hurried up the stairs. Fowler close behind him. At the third floor, Fowler pushed him roughly through the doorway, the snout of his rifle digging urgently into his back. He found himself in a corridor of doors, endless offices. Keep going, Fowler snarled. Down the hall! Hurry! Tolby hurried, his mind spinning. What the hell are you? I could never do it! Fowler gasped, close to his ear. Not in a million years! But it's got to be done! Tolby halted. What is this? They faced each other defiantly, faces contorted, eyes blazing. He's in there, Fowler snapped, indicating a door with his rifle. You have uh, one chance. Take it. For a fraction of a second, Tolby hesitated. Then he broke away. Okay, I'll take it. Fowler followed after him. Be careful. Watch your step. There's a series of checkpoints. Keep going straight in all the way, as far as you can go. And for God's sake, hurry. His voice faded as Tolby gained speed. He reached the door and tore it open. Soldiers and officials ballooned. He threw himself against them. They sprawled and scattered. He scrambled on as they struggled up and stupidly fumbled for their guns. Through another door, into an inner office, past a desk where a frightened girl sat, eyes wide, mouth open, then a third door, into an alcove. A wild-faced youth leaped up and snatched frantically for his pistol. Tolby was unarmed, trapped in the alcove. Figures already pushed against the door behind him. He gripped his ironite staff and backed away as the blonde-haired fanatic fired blindly. The bolt burst a foot away. It flicked him with a tongue of heat. You dirty anarchist! Green screamed. His face distorted. He fired again and again. You murdering anarchist spy! Tolby hurled his ironite staff. He put all his strength in it. The staff leaped through the air in a whistling arc, straight at the youth's head. Green saw it coming and ducked. Agile and quick, he jumped away, grinning humorlessly. The staff crashed against the wall and rolled, clanging to the floor. Your walking staff! Green gasped and fired. The bolt missed him on purpose. Green was playing games with him. Tolby went down and groped frantically for the staff. He picked it up. Green watched, face rigid, eyes glittering. Throw it again, he snarled. Tolby leaped. He took the youth by surprise. Green grunted, stumbled back from the impact, then suddenly fought with maniacal fury. Tolby was heavier, but he was exhausted. He had crawled hours, beat his way through the mountains, walked endlessly. He was at the end of his strength. The car wreck, the days of walking. Green was in perfect shape. His wiry, agile body twisted away. His hands came up. Fingers dug into Tolby's windpipe. He kicked the youth in the groin. Green staggered back, convulsed, and bent over with pain. All right, Green gasped, face ugly and dark. His hand fumbled with his pistol. The barrel came up. Half of Green's head dissolved. His hands opened, and his gun fell to the floor. His body stood for a moment, then settled down in a heap, like an empty suit of clothes. Tolby caught a glimpse of a rifle snout pushed past him, and the man with the tool belt. The man waved him on frantically. Hurry! Tolby raced down a carpeted hall between two great flickering yellow lamps. A crowd of officials and soldiers stumbled uncertainly after him, shouting and firing at random. He tore open a thick oak door and halted. He was in a luxurious chamber. Drapes, rich wallpaper, lamps, bookcases, a glimpse of the finery of the past, the wealth of the old days. Thick carpets, warm radiant heat, a vid screen, at the far end a huge mahogany desk. At the desk a figure sat, working on heaps of papers and reports, piled masses of material. 
The figure contrasted starkly with the lushness of the furnishings. It was a great, pitted, corroded tank of metal, bent and greenish, patched and repaired, an ancient machine. "'Is that you, Fowler?' the robot demanded. Tolby advanced, his ironite staff gripped. The robot turned angrily. "'Who is it? Get green and carry me down into the shelter. One of the roadblocks has reported a league agent already—' The robot broke off, its cold mechanical eye lens bored up at the man. It clicked and whirred in uneasy astonishment. I don't know you. It saw the ironite staff. League agent, the robot said. You're the one who got through. Comprehension came. The third one. You came here. You didn't go back. Its metal fingers fumbled clumsily at the objects on the desk. Then in the drawer, it found a gun and raised it awkwardly. Tolby knocked the gun away. It clattered to the floor. Run, he shouted at the robot. Start running. It remained. Tolby's staff came down. The fragile, complex brain unit of the robot burst apart. Coils, wiring, relay fluid spattered over his arms and hands. The robot shuddered. Its machinery thrashed. It half rose from its chair, then swayed and toppled. It crashed full length on the floor, parts and gears rolling in all directions. Good God, Tolby said, suddenly seeing it for the first time. Shakily, he bent over its remains. It was crippled. Men were all around him. He's killed boars, shocked, dazed faces. Boars is dead. Fowler came up slowly. You got him, all right. There's nothing left now. <laughs> Tolby stood holding his ironite staff in his hands. The poor blasted thing, he said softly, completely helpless. Sitting there and I came and killed him. He didn't have a chance. The building was bedlam. Soldiers and officials scurried crazily about, grief-stricken, hysterical. They bumped into each other, gathered in knots, shouted and gave meaningless orders. Tolby pushed past them. Nobody paid any attention to him. Fowler was gathering up the remains of the robot, collecting the smashed pieces and bits. Tolby stopped beside him. Like Humpty Dumpty, pulled down off his wall, he'd never be back together, not now. "'Where's the woman?' he asked Fowler. "'The league agent,' they brought in. Fowler straightened up slowly. "'I'll take you.' He led Tolby down the packed, surging hall to the hospital wing of the building. Sylvia sat up apprehensively as the two men entered the room. What's going on? She recognized her father. Dad, thank God, it was you who got out. Tolby slammed the door against the chaos of sound hammering up and down the corridor. How are you? How's the leg? M mending. What, what happened? I got him. The robot. He's dead. For a moment, the three of them were silent. Outside, in the halls, men ran frantically back and forth. Word had already leaked out. Troops gathered in huddled knots outside the building. Lost men, wandering away from their posts. Uncertain. Aimless. It's over, Fowler said. Tolby nodded. I know. They'll get tired of crouching in their foxholes, Fowler said. They'll come filtering back. As soon as the news reaches them... They'll desert and throw away their equipment. Good, Tolby grunted. The sooner the better. He touched Fowler's rifle. You too, I hope. Sylvia hesitated. Do you think... Think what? Did we make a mistake? Tolby grinned wearily. Hell of a time to think about that. He was doing what he thought was right. They built up their homes and factories, this, this whole area. They... they... They turn out a lot of goods. Uh, I've been watching through the window. It's made me think. They've done so much, made so much. Made a lot of guns, Tolby said. We have guns, too. We kill and destroy. We have all the disadvantages and none of the advantages. We don't have war, Tolby answered quietly. To defend this neat little organization, there are 10,000 men up there in those hills, all waiting to fight waiting to drop their bombs and bacteria pellets to keep this place running. But they won't. Pretty soon, they'll give up 
and start to trickle back. The whole system will decay rapidly, Fowler said. He was already losing his control. He couldn't keep the clock back much longer. <sighs> Anyhow, it's done, Sylvia murmured. We did our job, she smiled a little. Bors did his job and we did ours, but the times were against him and with us. <laughs> That's right, Tolby agreed. We did our job and we'll never be sorry. Fowler said nothing. He stood with his hands in his pockets, gazing silently out the window. His fingers were touching something. Three undamaged synopsis coils. Intact memory elements from the dead robot snatched from the scattered remains. Just in case, he said to himself, just in case the times change. The End You've been listening to a short story entitled The Last of the Masters, also known as Protection Agency. It was written by Philip K. Dick and performed by Frank Mark Coppolis. The story is in the public domain, and the performance is copyright 2021 by Frank J. Markopoulos. It was recorded at the Bookquarium Recording Studio. For more, please visit frankmarkopoulos.com. And to help support my work, please consider visiting patreon.com slash frankmarkopoulos. That's patreon.com slash F-R-A-N-K-M-A-R-C-O-P-O-L-O-S, where you can support me for as little as a dollar a month. As always, I thank you for your time and I thank you for your attention. Bookquarium Audio.